so welcome welcome to the weekend's uh, podcast right so i am vaske varadan right so i work as a technical lead over here at uh, weekends so i look majorly into the back end microservices side the platform side of things right so i'm mostly a back end and devops uh, engineer or from a ship right so you know uh, can you give a bit of introduction of yourself sure so i'm uh, i'm jerome petazzini uh, i'm also mostly a back end person myself <laughs> to be honest um and uh, i worked in different areas like I, i always worked with open source technologies i would say um and i started mostly working with infrastructure virtualization then i joined docker and i worked seven years at docker like from uh, 2011 to 20 only 2018 um and now uh, i do docker and kubernetes training and consulting as well okay nice so I'm getting to place topic right so we're nicely looking into the uh, docker kubernetes and best practices and things around it right so before uh, we get into the crux of our docker and kubernetes i guess uh, we can start off with a bit of extreme basic right so uh, can we go through what, what is a container sure uh, so what what's dog what's docker what's kubernetes so i remember uh, when i was living in san francisco um i was always trying to find new ways to explain uh what i do basically and and very often you know i was uh in a cab or uber or lift and then often you make conversation and i was trying to think okay how can i explain uh what docker is uh to somebody who's non technical well they're always a little bit technical because if you are a cab or lift or uber driver in san francisco you are always technical a little bit anyway um but uh and, and the best explanation i found for docker was well you know how we have the app store on our phones that make it super easy for us to install any application you go to the app store you tap on the thing and seconds later boom the the app r- works on your phone docker is kind of like that but for developers and for the stuff that developers need when they build applications uh maybe they need some database or something to transform addresses into coordinates or whatever or all kind of things uh, and docker can help with that and docker can also help them uh, to put their own applications uh, in these things we call containers so that then they can be uh, executed so that they can be installed on pretty much any machine anywhere maybe you have a mac maybe a, you have a windows machine maybe i have a linux computer maybe our servers are on linux or something else and thanks to containers we can get everything to kind of work the same way uh, anywhere so that's for the docker part and then if we try to explain kubernetes it gets uh, a little bit more complicated but i found like what i the explanation i like is to say uh, docker is great as long as you only have one computer to run your application so if you have a you know maybe it's your development environment like typically like most of us develop on a on a single machine of course some of us might have multiple computers but usually when we work we work on one computer now when we go to production when we serve thousands or even millions of users um one computer one server will not be enough so we will need to have clusters uh, and that's where something like kubernetes works great I think Docker got everyone super excited like wow this is awesome but as soon as I have multiple computers how do I get them to coordinate well and that's when we did this thing called orchestration and that's where uh, Kubernetes comes in. So yeah, I actually like the idea of what you gave for an app store kind of its apple right so you just pull out an application you just run it and it works. Yeah, with net for the most simplest definitions that I have heard for talk it's like Thanks. because yeah back in today like when we were uh, looking into the initial times right where uh, we were on docker v1 or uh, things like that when container 
as a concept itself was very new, right? We had this uh, whole process of setting a virtual machine, getting all things right on the hypervisor level, get everything sorted out. I mean, a huge uh, image, right? The VM image that goes into a deployment. Yeah, it like now with uh, Docker and all, it is as I said, as simple as it as installing an application, a small yeah. chunk of things where you have all the required executables, uh, kernel executables, and you just have your application. Just pull yeah. it from it and it works. It, it basically like if it works on my system, it will work on your system. Cool. Yes, yeah. I think. Yeah, and also in terms of as I said, in continuous orchestration, right? Like that makes sense. Like when we go into production, scalability, how many availability, everything becomes a talking point, right? Like, including with uh, Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, or any other continuous orchestration tool for that matter, right? For yeah. far, as far as I have seen in practical experience, which has made Kubernetes a swarm of huge success is because as a developer, I don't need to worry about how things work. I just put it up and it is production ready. Right? You build it off yeah. a container, you put it into Kubernetes, you create a cluster, it orchestrates everything. It can auto-scale, auto-downscale, do all kinds of wizardry at the back end. Exactly. At least that's a theory, yes. <laughs> Not theory, yes. And on an executable front that we have a lot of things to look into. Yeah. But that's that. So, coming into Docker itself, right? So, where we are building an application or something as simple as a CRUD microservice, right? Some Node.js microservice or Spring Boot microservice, right? That we are building. And we have decided that we'll go with a container. And Docker was our tool that we are using, right? So can we just uh, talk through what would be the best practices in terms of how we could use uh, Docker or in, or in simple terms, how we can containerize uh, our application in the best possible way? Sure. So when I think about best practices around Docker and Kubernetes, uh, I try to think at multiple levels. Uh, first, on the high level, to have, I think some people call that a North Star, you know, like the guiding star that you always follow, but it's it's very high level. And for me, this is, uh, we want to take the path that is the, the, the shortest and the easiest and the most um, comfortable and, and almost enjoyable, I would say. Um, because the goal of Docker is to make our lives easier, at least our work lives as, as developers and Ox people, like to, to make that easier. Um, so for instance, um, for me, one, one reason for using Docker is make it easy to get started with an application. Um, so thanks to Docker, uh, very often we can have getting started instructions that are literally uh, clone that repo and run something like Docker Compose up, or maybe if it's just an application with one container, maybe it's going to be Docker build and Docker run and that's it. And um, I think uh, one of the friction points uh, in the beginning of Docker and, and still today actually, is that if you talk to, let's say a Ruby expert, the Ruby expert will tell you, no, I don't want to do that. Look, we have all these amazing tools. We have Capistrano, we have Bundler, we have all these things. We don't need something like Docker. Then you talk to the Python people and they tell you, oh, look, we have virtual and, and we have Conda and we have like all these things. So we don't need something like Docker. Then you talk to, let's say the Java people and they're like, well, we have Maven and Gradle, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't need Docker. That's great, but it only works if you are a Ruby expert or a Python expert or a Java expert, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have someone who's not a Ruby expert and walks into a Ruby project, uh, they're like, wait, I'm, I'm supposed to have like this Capistrano and Bundler and this and that, and I don't know any of this. And the getting started instructions assume that I already have Ruby installed 
um, and that, that they have all these tools. Uh, and so then when you try to get started, it just doesn't work. Same thing with Java. A uh, lot, most Java apps, you know, outside of the Docker world, they assume that you have uh, the JDK, like the Java compiler, installed on your machine. Uh, but they don't always tell you which version you need, uh, how to install the dependencies. It's more like, oh, look, you just run uh, Maven, like MVN check or, or Gradle W this or etc. Um, and yeah, if you have the same version of Java and Maven and etc. as the people who wrote the app, then you're good. But if you have um, different versions, or if, if you don't have this installed on your machine, then things get not that nice. And so I think in the in the beginning, um, we we had many people being very excited because they're like, "Wow, it's cool!" Because I'm I'm not a Java expert, and now I can build this Java code in, on my machine in two lines. Great. But then we had the Java experts. I mean, some of them in the beginning were like, eh, no, I don't, I don't like that Docker thing. It seems to be extra uh, complications in a way. And I think it's extra complication in, in the same way that when we use uh, these tools, like uh, yeah, uh, Maven, Gradle, Bundler, uh, and uh, even like uh, uh, Yarn on, on, on the Node ecosystem, etc. cetera, uh, using them is a little bit of extra work. Uh, for, for the person using them, but it's a little bit of extra work for one person so that everyone else can be a more efficient developer, like a more effective developer. And with Docker, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, one person needs to put a little bit of extra work uh, so that it's easier for everybody else. Um, but if we, if yeah, if we keep in mind this goal, okay, I, I want to make things easier for everyone else, you know, for the for the folks who are not expert in that particular language or framework, then we have a good guiding star, good direction. Then if we try to be a more, I would say, uh, tactical, you know, if we think about, okay, now in concrete terms, what, what does that mean? How do we make things uh, easier for, for our co-workers or users, etc.? One one thing um, when working with Docker is that I try to stick to standard tooling. Um, so, for instance, I try to use Compose because honestly, with Compose you can cover like I don't know ninety to ninety nine percent of the uh, of the local development needs. It's not one hundred percent for sure, uh, but a lot of applications that I've seen or worked on uh, when you have a Compose file, honestly, it's it's so easy that it's almost unfair because it's literally like two lines, <laughs> clone the repo, <laughs> Docker compose up, and that works. And it works like truly everywhere. And sure, sometimes people point out, oh, well, no, I have this very special situation where it doesn't work because I don't know, I'm using like GPUs for machine learning or whatever. I'm like, yeah, that's right. Um, but if you take the same problem outside of Docker, it's going to be even more complicated, basically. So the Docker is definitely going to make our lives easier here. Another thing that I try to keep in mind um, is that the, the, I mean, again, the goal of Docker is to make my life easier when I work on code. Um, and so I want, I want my work to be faster. And so I want to get rid of the, the things that get in the way. So if I have a build that is very slow, because maybe um, each time I build, it reinstalls all the dependencies. So in that case, it's a pretty good sign that we we can certainly optimize that Docker file one way or another. Um, or um, if I realize, oh, my, my workflow is that I have to build and then I have to push that image to some other place so that I can test it. Uh, and then I realize I'm spending, you know, a few minutes each time to wait for the build and the push to happen. So then I'm like, okay, maybe it's a good idea at that point to try to optimize my my images. But what I'm trying to say is that, um, like, uh, optimizing images in itself, that that's not really an end goal. I mean, who cares if my image is 10 megs or 10 gigs? It's only a problem if I have to push that image 
uh, and if I have to push it multiple times a day, uh, if I have to push my image all the time to, I don't know, like to deploy it on some server to test it there or whatever, then yes, then it's a good idea to optimize it or, you know, find a way so that it's faster basically. Um, but otherwise, uh, it, it, that, that's why it's always, it depends. I, I, it reminds me of, um, there is this very famous um, uh, computer scientist, uh, Donald Knuth, who wrote a bunch of books about algorithms, etc. And I think he was the one who said uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil, uh, which means that sometimes we are tempted to think about, oh, I'm going to optimize that code. I'm going to use like a balance red black tree with this and that optimization for this data structure. But then if, if you had taken the time to profile the code, you would realize, oh no, the data structure is not the problem at all. The problem is something entirely different. Maybe it's this IO when we load the data, or maybe we're making some API call to some other service and that one is being super slow, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really my big takeaway here. Uh, with Docker, if I if there is a pain point, you know, if, if developers are like, oh, this sucks, this situation is, is not great. I'm like, okay, let's look at what's the pain point. What's the thing that you're complaining about? Um, is, is the build too slow or do you have to wait or too long? Or is the problem that each time you make a change, you need to rebuild or whatever. And then let's try to solve uh, that particular thing, basically. Yeah. And that's making a lot of sense. I like to a bit of rewind on things you're telling me to I still remember the days where uh, I mostly am a Java developer and I, I mostly work with uh, Node.js, uh, Java, uh, Spring Boot and Java to Python. Right? So even back in the day we were having days where, where, where we used to have Tomcat and even uh, WebSphere and everything properly set out, built EARs or WARs and take it to the web server and deploy it, right? Like, and on a, on a regular basis, yes, that uh, friction was there. Like, we, I have had people who had that kind of uh, friction. When we were uh, trying to talk, dockerize a few of our microservices, which were running as EARs on Tomcat, right? So people were not really... Um, happy and comfortable with mm -hmm. that now right like because they know that tomcat works and they're not very sure on if this will work or what kind of maintenance that they need to do all, all those things right like there were tons of questions that that they used to ask before even make that particular right now yeah. fast forward to today like there are very few there are quite a few softwares like for example, uh, Chromium project or uh, the Firefox project, right? Like things like this. As of date, you actually don't even need to set up your uh, system to build that particular code. Right? Like as of today, we have seen a lot of places where they use Docker as a build time environment, not even on time. Mm -hmm. right? Like basically, I have built out a few versions of uh, Firefox where it uses a Docker container to build the image. Because, and it is, as a developer, it makes my life so much more easier, right? Like, I don't need to go ahead and set up, yeah. set up everything that is required to compile Firefox. It just pulls out one Docker container, takes the clone of the code, it runs it, builds it, and, and as, as you have volume mount and all, it throws it back, back to my disk. Yeah, yeah. Right, like, it's so much more easier these days, right? And also in terms of, well, as you said, like, uh, is a build time going higher and all those things. These days with Docker layers and a lot, a lot of things, like, we also build that capability to cache our dependencies at each and every layer, right? Like every time it doesn't go out and install all the dependencies, even though the container is built from scratch. Right, intermediate containers and a lot, lot of things. I mean, yeah. Back from 2016 to today, I mean that that's a huge shift that we have, right? Like 
now most of them are pro docker pro containers right it might be docker it might be container d whatever the right time it might be but everyone as of today are moving to dockers right yeah i even saw a few days back where you gave an example for ai and ml models right where they use gpu and which which was a bit of speed point for docker i was actually reading a few days ago where uh there is actually a possibility to attach your uh, gpu to your docker containers and i have to actually give it a go on that but now that yeah. becomes a lot more promising right like now i can even if that's a possibility that i can even run my ai models on docker and still yeah. able to provision my gp yeah i think we there are two there are multiple levels and the, the first level that we have today is that it's already possible and i would say relatively easy uh, to have gpus in containers on linux um, and thanks to the 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 nvidia runtime um, so that that works fairly well and uh, it it really solves a lot of problems um, and then it's a, it's a different story when we are on mac or windows though because of then you have a in a way you have to cross more layers of abstraction uh when you run containers on linux it's uh the processes are running almost like directly on the machine there is no no extra virtualization thing so exposing the gpu to the container is not very hard um now when we are on windows or on the mac uh it gets more complicated because the container actually runs in the linux vm the linux vm runs on top of the mac or windows machine so if we want to access the gpu uh, we need to have a, a specific way to expose that gpu from the machine to the linux vm and then to the container now, I, I was recently reading that technically there are things um, that exist. Um, I mean, it's uh, it's the kind of stuff where it requires an alignment of the whole ecosystem. Um, so, for instance, on the GPU side, you need to have a way to... One possibility is to kind of partition that GPU uh, so that you can say, hey, instead of having one GPU, in fact, I have two virtual GPUs maybe one for for my system because I still need to show something on the screen and you know play my games and movies and whatever and then I have the second virtual GPU that maybe I'm gonna plug inside this uh, docker uh, virtual machine so with that idea it means that if we wanted to have GPU support support in uh, let's say docker desktop or rancher desktop or all, all these apps on uh, on Mac or Windows we would need something on the GPU driver side, on the Docker, like Docker desktop, Crunchyroll desktop side, and then in Docker itself. Uh, it's all these things would need to kind of agree together on on what to do, uh, which which can seem like uh, complicated and oh wow we you know it, it needs a lot of people to agree together about how to make that happen, but honestly. Uh, I felt that way uh, five to yeah five five six years ago when we started having Docker Desktop. I was already thinking, wow, to to have Docker Desktop, uh, this is going to require lots of people uh, kind of agreeing and aligning a lot of different technologies, uh, and then eventually it just happened. You know, combination of really great engineering folks and good communication between the teams, etc. Same thing when we got. Um, Docker, Docker Windows with the Windows containers. You know, like I, I, in 2013, in one of my first presentations about containers, um, I remember I had a, a really funny slide at the end of the presentation explaining that containers were not specific to uh, to to Linux, uh, that we also had FreeBSD uh, jails and Solaris zones, and then I had a little thing with the Windows logo, and then I had the the, the 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 picture of a laughing face to say ah no we'll never have container of windows but then <laughs> jokes on me because a few years later 
uh, we actually have Docker running on Windows and we even have um, in Windows containers since uh, Windows Server 2016 or something like that. So that was really unexpected uh, and yet it happened. So honestly, uh, I would not be surprised if within, you know, it, it could be as soon as next month or maybe next, next year, but I would not be surprised if we had GPU support uh, for containers on Linux. I mean, already on Linux, but Mac and Windows as well, uh, especially because of all the excitement and all the stuff happening around uh, machine learning and large language models and like all these things right now, like it's super hot space. So it would not be surprising if there were some folks at, I don't know, maybe at Docker Inc or maybe at Apple or maybe at Microsoft or maybe at Nvidia or maybe some combination of all that. Some folks trying to get like GPU acceleration to work in Docker containers. Um, and if it's not folks at these companies, maybe it's going to be some independent folks kind of hacking this uh, together, like making making this happen. I, I have no idea, you know, maybe nobody is actually working on this or maybe they're trying, but it's super hard and there are obstacles I don't know about. Uh, but, you know, if, if, if next week they have an announcement like, oh, now you can run CUDA GPU accelerated stuff on Docker on, on, on Windows, I would not be surprised a single bit. Yeah, that's there, right? Like, because if you see the current hardware space, for instance, the current lineup of Intel CPUs that came out with uh, Apple's ARM migration, everyone are now currently building out AI and ML accelerators onto the SOC itself. Right? So on, yeah. on a Mac, you already have uh, AI accelerators with Intel. Now you got AI accelerator with the current uh, lineup. NVIDIA and AMD are supporting on the GPU front from a very long time. NVIDIA being the pioneer on that front. Mm -hmm. Like, I wait, would it even suppose, surprise me if we got that support very soon? Because almost all the hardware uh, manufacturers, SOC manufacturers, are looking into this particular space. Even yeah. now, currently, Intel, even CPU manufacturers want a piece of that cake. Right? They are building out accelerators yeah. at the hardware, right? So, definitely, it boils down to Linux and Microsoft coming together, right? And even Apple coming together to figure out how we could do this. I mean, at the end of the day, there are there are a few uh, hypervisors where everything run, runs on. On Linux, probably it's KVM and in uh, Windows, we have the Intel uh, VTX and other hypervisors that we have for in the Microsoft realm, Mac OS is pretty much Linux-like, right? So, mm -hmm. and now, and so all of all of your KVM stuff will still work on that. So, as as you said, like even I would be even a bit surprised if this comes through very fast. Yeah, and currently, I even see that uh, Docker themselves have come up with cross-platform compilation since the Apple ARM um, happened, right? I see your job. Yeah, build X that has come. Build X has come out. Right now, you can build containers for ARM processors. You can build out for x86 processors. You can cross compile it in each and one of them. So, the things that I run on my uh, M1 Mac, I build, I can still build a container for Intel, Intel processor. On an Intel processor, I can on an Intel Intel Mac, I can still build uh, a container that runs on ARM. Like, yeah, yeah, I see that thing coming through, right? Like, it, it's no longer even Intel specific or ARM specific for the fact that like that ecosystem is growing more and more uh, unified. Like, like basically, you throw a container on any system that should work, kind of thing. Right. So on that front to coming to a bit of anti patterns, right? So I mean there are a lot of cons and uh misdirected approaches that people a lot of people use in Docker and Kubernetes. Right today. Yeah, so uh, 
I think um, in the domain of anti-patterns, usually, you know, if I echo back what we were seeing earlier, like the, the anti-pattern would be if I do something that uh, makes me waste my time, basically. So again, you're like long builds or big images. So a few examples, like things I've, I've seen uh, a lot in the field, um, images that are too big uh, because, um, well, maybe they have build dependencies and then you can use multi-stage builds or something like that. But another one that is often a little bit harder to convince people to change about is um, be be careful about including data sets in images. If it's small data sets, like a few megs, it's okay. But bigger data sets of tens or hundreds of megabytes or even multiple gigabytes, um, I personally, I consider that to be an anti-pattern because it makes the images really big for no reason. And it it's going to slow us down everywhere because now if I want to run the image locally, I, I have to uh, build and run that huge image uh, while I could just use, for instance, a, a volume mount to, to expose my data set or my uh, model weights and parameters uh, to, the, to the container. And when, when I deploy that image to production, then again, I have this huge image uh, while I could have a much smaller one um, and I could deploy the, the data set uh, separately. Uh, another example is when we have images with tons and tons of things in them. Uh, sometimes it's because folks need tools. They're like, well, we often have these issues in production and it's really convenient to have, I don't know, maybe grep or TCP dump or netstat. And also, you know, like the, the, the issue is that it starts with a few tools where everyone agrees like, yeah, that's really convenient. Uh, and then a few months later, everyone added their favorite tool in the image and uh, it gets a little bit out of hand. Um, so there are uh, lots of really great techniques that can be used to avoid that. Personally, one thing I like to do, uh, for instance, is to, when possible, I try to use uh, Alpine base images. Uh, well, they're small. But um, you still have a package manager. So if you need something, you know, like you have this one particular weird problem in production, you know, like, oh, I wish I had, I don't know, curl and JQ and this and this and this, you can enter the container and you can install packages in literally seconds. Um, so that's, uh, that, that's super helpful. Now, of course, some folks will say, no, 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 we don't want to do that because uh, that's a kind of security issue. Um, we want to have really small images with no vulnerabilities. So we're using stuff like uh, Distroless or uh, Wolfie by uh, Shengard. And I think it's fine too. It's just a compromise. It's like, yep, it's, I'm going to gain a lot in, in like safety, security, but it means that if I have to troubleshoot a production issue, it will be more difficult. It, it, it won't be impossible. You know, if I'm on Kubernetes, I can use uh, debug containers. I can use ephemeral containers. I can, uh, lots of things that we can do, uh, but it, it's going to make things a little bit harder for me or for my team. So it's, again, it's a good idea to, to assess like, you know, if we, for instance, if, if I tell my team, hey, so if we have this problem in production, um, this is how we access things. You do kubectl exec in the pod and you install your stuff. And, you know, hopefully here everybody is like, okay, that seems easy enough. If you have people having issues uh, with that, then you need to kind of backtrack a little bit and, and think about even easier ways. Now, if everybody is fine with kubectl exec, you can go to the next level, which is, well, if you have a problem in production, uh, you want to use um, kubectl debug or in, in older versions of Kubernetes, it's going to be Kubernetes alpha debug when it was still like an alpha feature. Um, and you need to, I don't know, like edit the pod to add a new container image to it, etc. And you see kind of what's the reaction of the team. Is everyone like, yep, yep, we know how to do that. That's easy. Then great. You can, you can do that. 
or maybe they start being like, wait a minute, how do we actually do that? Um, another possibility, uh, if you want to use something like like you know very very small images, something like distroless, uh, etc., but you still want to be able to add tools in there, uh, you can invest in uh, Nix. Uh, Nix is this kind of uh, uh, functional uh, packaging system. And so you have a Linux distribution based on that called NixOS, and you have a bunch of packages like a, a package repository called NixPKG. And one thing that is a little bit magic with Nix is that you can drop uh, a package and its dependencies on the system, and it's going to work no matter what. It's a little bit like static builds, uh, but we generalize that. Um, like we, we know that if you if you want to install a tool, um, if it has dependencies, you need to install the dependencies as well. And that's why some folks really love to work with Go because with Go, you can bundle everything in the binary. And that's why you get some pretty big binaries. Like I think if you look like at the Docker or Kubernetes CLI, they can be like 50 megs, <laughs> but at least you have all the dependencies in there. Um, and so Nix kind of does that, but in a, in a more general way. Uh, it doesn't matter if the program is in Go or C or whatever else. Um, with Nix, you can have this, again, like this thing that you drop in the container and boom, it works. So that's another way um, to have these very minimal images and yet be able to install troubleshooting tools uh, when, when you need them. Um, another thing, okay, that one is not, it's not a huge one, but I've seen a few folks do that. Um, put, uh, compressed files like zip or tar or gzip, etc. compressed files in images, and then they compress them, uh, when the container starts. And I, so that's an anti-pattern for a couple of reasons. Um, first, the files get compressed in the images anyway. So when we push and pull images, the layers get compressed. So if I have a, if I have a bunch of data and I zip it thinking, oh, I'm optimizing my images. No, I'm not optimizing my images. I'm even making things worse because when you try to compress something that's already compressed, it's using a lot of CPU for, for nothing. Um, plus if we do that, you know, if I'm thinking, oh, I have this, um, big data set. So I'm zipping it. And then when the container starts, I am unzipping it. Well, first, this is going to slow down, uh, the container start, uh, and it's going to use a lot of disk space. Uh, if I have my data set unzipped, uh, in my image, when I, when I start, let's say 10 copies of that container, um, I just get 10 copies of the container and thanks to copy on write, uh, I don't need to copy my data set 10 times. Now, if I start 10 containers and the same container, but that container unzips uh, a data set when it starts, then I end up with 10 times that data set on disk. So I was thinking, oh, I'm being smart and optimizing, etc. And at the end of the day, no, I'm, I'm doing the exact opposite of optimizing because I'm using more CPU and more disk space and I the container takes more time to start. So that's another anti-pattern that I've seen a few times. Um, another thing, and now I'm kind of going back to my uh, North Star of earlier, you know, when I said, oh, we want containers to make things easier for us. Another anti-pattern that I see sometimes is when people kind of force you to run things in Docker. The way um, earlier I was saying, um, it's it's great when we have instructions telling us this is how you run the code in Docker. But to be clear, I'm not saying that this should be the only instructions, you know, right? And and some people take that a little bit too far in like, hey, this is my this is my program. You don't even know what language this is in, um, and to run it, you Docker build, Docker run, or Docker compose up. Um, and if you want to run it locally, well. Good luck because that's uh, that's not possible or that's really hard, and and that in my opinion that's when we got a little bit too far. I think the for me like, the best scenario is 
for instance, hey, we have this Java application. It's built using Maven or Gradle or something else. Uh, and there is a Docker file, which means that you can also run it with a Docker build. So that way you have the best of the best of both worlds. If I'm a Java expert, I can use the Java specific instructions and run that code locally and directly open that up in, I don't know, IntelliJ or whatever and use GMX and et cetera, et cetera. But if I don't know anything about Java, then I can just Docker build, Docker run, uh, and it works. But if I force people to use Docker build, Docker run, uh, now if I'm the Java expert, I'm like, wait a minute, how do I, how do I attach my IDE to that? How do I connect to GMX to see what's going on in the VM? Um, and now we are kind of going against our initial principle, which was let's make things easier for developers. Um, so, and, and so, so that's the, that, that's another thing I, I try to be careful with that. And very often when I see folks complaining about Docker, like, oh, they, there is Docker everywhere. Um, the problem is when, when folks are like, Hey, okay, you know, like I, this is going to run in containers and we're trying to hide what's happening behind the scenes. It's a little bit like when shipping a binary instead of source code in a way, you know, like if I have a binary, the goal is to have something really easy for my users. They have the binary, they download it, they run it. And that's the case for almost all the, the, the windows applications and the applications on our phones. Uh, great. Now, if I'm a developer, binaries suck. I don't want to have a binary. I want to have some source code and I want to edit the code and run it, etc. So I think. You know, like for, for me, it, it's not a question of, oh, is it better to have, uh, again, I'm sticking to Java here. Is it better to have Maven or a Docker file? I think this is a really stupid question. The answer is you need both. <laughs> you know, like, am I, uh, do, do I need to have the source code or the binary of my app? Well, you need both. You need the source code when you work as a developer on the app and you need the binary when you ship it. For, for me, like, it's a no brainer, you know, we shouldn't even be asking ourselves these questions. And so it's kind of the same thing, um, for, you know, a, a repo on GitHub, for instance. Um, I think we need both. I need the instructions for the developer who's going to open up that code in their IDE and make some changes and yep, hack on stuff. And I also need the Docker file or maybe the Docker image for the person who's going to run it, you know, the, the person who doesn't really care about the source code at this point, because again, this is a Java project and I'm not a Java expert, so I wouldn't know exactly what to do, uh, but I want to run it. So make it easy, uh, to run it. And of course we need both. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense right? to, I just started one question out there when we were talking about Docker, you made size right? So in your experience, what would be the optimal size of a container? It's a really good question. Like what's the, what's the right size? Of course, it depends on what we are building and packaging. Um, and so I, I don't have, uh, hard numbers, but more, uh, I like to say there are numbers where I'm going to start asking questions. So for instance, if there is a microservice and the image is more than 100 megs, I'm going to have a look. I'm not saying this is bad, but I'm going, well, let's have a look and see why this is more than 100 megs. Uh, maybe there is a good reason. Um, you know, like, especially, uh, we were talking about GPUs and, and machine learning earlier. Uh, the, the dependencies in that field tend to be really big. Uh, especially when you use GPUs, I tend to remember, I think it's, uh, uh, PyTorch, which, which is one of the really popular like machine learning frameworks, uh, PyTorch CPU version, I think it's like 700 megs. Uh, so of course, if you, <laughs> if you run that in containers, uh, even if it's a microservice doing inference on a fairly simple model. If he, if it runs on PyTorch, it's still going to be at least 700 megs because that's how big the package is. 
Um, mm -hmm. And if you go with a GPU, it's even worse. It's I think uh, when you just like uh, pip install um, uh, the torch uh, on, on and, and you want the, the NVIDIA GPU acceleration, I think it's something like two or 2.5 gigs. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure why I tried to look a little bit into it once and I ended up seeing some uh, library files and like dot ESO, dot SOs. I, I remember having a shock when I saw a dot SO file that was, uh, it was more than 700 megs. And I thought in, in my head, wow, that wouldn't fit in the, in the Linux install CD, you know, like back in the days when we had CDs. <laughs> Uh, that single library file wouldn't fit on one CD. Whoa! Um, so of course, in that case, I'm I'm not going to tell people, oh, your image is more than 100 megs, it's bad. No, you, we have good reasons. Um, but if it's a, a, a microservice, in, yeah, Go, Rust, uh, Python without machine learning, etc. That that's where I would start looking. Um, now for monolithic apps. Uh, you know, it, it could be one gig and it could be fine. I think that there would be really two ways to go about it. You know, one way would be, hey, I'm doing some kind of audit of an app or platform. And I, I don't know exactly what I'm looking for in that case, if it's really abstract. So maybe I would just look at what are the biggest images and start there. You know, if you, uh, it's, it's like when you're trying to save money, it's easier to look at the stuff where you spend the most money, basically. Uh, so if you're just, I don't know, buying a little bit of bread uh, every day, that's probably not the, the thing where you can save the most money. Uh, but if you're having like fancy drinks at the bar every day, that's pretty more expensive. So here you can probably save more. So same thing here, let's look at the size of the images and let's start with the biggest ones. Now, honestly, you know, if I, if I go back to my guiding principles, um, if I try to think about what's the right size of images, I think for me, that wouldn't be the right question. The right question would be more like, what are people complaining about? Um, usually people don't complain about big images directly. It's more like, oh, it sucks because when we, when we push code uh, to Git, uh, then it takes like, half an hour before the code is uh, deployed in the staging environment. Uh, can we reduce that? And then when we look, we're like, aha, uh, the image is so big that it takes like 10 minutes to build and to push. So there is some, some savings uh, to, to be done uh, there. Or maybe another pain point is the ops team like, well, uh, every week we have to manually like delete old images in the registry um, because it's like 50 terabytes uh, and it costs us a bunch of money, um, uh, you know, and, and, and so maybe that's the pain point. And then we look and we're like, okay, what's the problem? Is it maybe we have something that automatically build new images every five minutes <laughs> and, uh, and, and the, the, the size keeps increasing or maybe the problem is indeed that the images are super big, uh, and may maybe we can optimize things there. So that's why I wouldn't really say this size is good or bad. It's more like, okay, is the size, the problem that I'm struggling with right now? Um, yeah, that, that would be my guideline. Yeah. Because I've seen a few frameworks which are like uh, a simple front end based uh, frameworks, like for example, Next.js. You build this simple Next.js application and you have a simple uh, Docker file for that, right? You'll end up uh, having a container of more than one gig in it. Right? Something like, as you said, uh, the framework itself uh, is uh, very heavy. Yeah, yeah. That, that can definitely happen, yeah. Also, one of the things that I had observed was uh, people doing a lot of manual operations. And for some reason, I found this a bit of, I don't know, but it's a pattern because uh, today we have really good DevOps processes, right? We even have GitOps integrated, so 
every commit we have a build on a PR. Uh, the GitOps is able to now get back to the PR saying that is this code even working or not, right? Like the build mm-hmm. passes, build fails. If the build fails, it automatically rejects the PR. Not a good practice of compound in GitOps. Right? Yeah, but I absolutely. In the, I see a lot of people using the manual now procedures. It like they have a disconnected way of now uh, doing things, uh, building where they build a container, how how they build a container now uh, uh, specifically. Right. So, do you have any uh, views on that particular thing? Yeah, that's that's a really good point. I think, uh, and that kind of joins another. Um anti-pattern that I see sometimes on the Kubernetes side, which is manual work. Um, I think it, it's great in the beginning, you know, when we are learning, uh, it's great to do things manually, um, mostly because that's the only way we know. You know, it's like, well, I have a, I have my Docker file and then I bind it and then I push that to the registry and then I create a Kubernetes deployment and yay, everything is running. But then if I want to change a line of code, I kind of repeat the whole thing, you know, change the line of code and build and push and update my Kubernetes deployment. Um, and um, it's a lot of um, a lot of repetition. And so there are multiple problems that can happen here. Well, first, um, we, we waste a lot of time there just because of all these manual operations. Um, so here it's great to use tools like, for instance, uh, scaffold or tilt and, and that makes it really impressive because sure, if I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm really good with the keyboard, I type really fast and I have multiple terminals open. So first terminal, I docker build and then docker push. And then in another one, I update the deployment YAML and et cetera, et cetera. So maybe it takes me like a few minutes and it's great. But what's super impressive is that with tools like Tilt and Scaffold, it's going to completely automate that. Like I, I save my, my source code and it's going to detect, ha, huh, you changed the, the source code. So I'm going to automatically build and push and update the YAML. Um, and when I, when I do like a Kubernetes training and I, and I show that in action, it, it's really impressive because literally while I'm doing the demo, you know, I'm, I'm saving, I explain what's going on. I go to the, the other window or terminal where you have the logs and you already see the, the, the new logs of the, of the new application. So it literally 10 seconds, uh, the, for a microservice, you know, the microservice that I change the code locally and 10 seconds later, uh, it's running on my Kubernetes cluster. So that's, uh, that, that's really impressive um and the the goal is to shorten the the iteration loop you know like i uh, I, I think a, a really good way i mean the, the way for me to understand that was to think about um if it takes me an hour uh to make changes and see these changes then it means that even if i work eight hours during the day i, I can make eight experiments you know i can Eight times I can make some changes and see the results. Now, if instead of one hour, it takes one minute, then it means I can do the, the same thing, the same number of experiments uh, in 10 minutes. <laughs> so now instead of being limited, you know, by how fast my deployment pipeline is going, now I'm limited by how fast I can write code and, and think about code, etc. Um, so that, that makes me like a much faster programmer. I remember when I was a kid, um, I was seeing sometimes in some, uh, programming like, uh, magazines that was something I think like, I'm not, I'm not sure about the exact numbers, but let's say, oh, the new Chobo Pascal compiler is out and it can do like 50,000 lines per second. And I was like, wow, 50,000 lines. That's more code that maybe I would write in my entire life. Like, what's the point of having something that fast? Um, but then later I thought, hmm, actually that's a really good point because um, if I have a really big code base, if my compiler is slow, I'm back to exactly my same problem. You know, make changes, build, wait an hour, and then I can 
test my changes and see what happens. If I have a super fast compiler, I make my changes and a few seconds later, I can immediately test my changes and, 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 and go back and iterate, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, uh, that, that's, that's one thing. Another thing, uh, in the field of automation, uh, Again, when we get started, we, we do all these things manually, you know, create the Kubernetes cluster and uh, build the image and push it and create the deployment. And maybe we create like a, an ingress and we deploy the ingress controller by following some tutorial that we found uh, somewhere. Um, so that's great. Uh, and, and I think we, sh we should absolutely do that when we learn, but then the next step should be to automate all that. Uh, you know, take some, uh, maybe it's just, it's just shell scripts, maybe it's a tool like Terraform or Pulumi or CloudFormation or whatever. But all these things that we did, uh, you know, manually, sometimes painfully, uh, I think we need to automate them so that if tomorrow or next week or in three months, if I need to redo the whole thing, I want to be able to push a button and have everything go in place by itself um, instead of, oh yeah, I vaguely remember how I did that three months ago. Uh, I think I followed that blog post and there was that YAML. Ah, uh, no, it's this other one, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, you know, like as, as soon as we have the thing like, okay, this works, the next step should be automated. Um, and again, it's uh, some folks are going to be huge fans of maybe Terraform or Helm or etc. Uh, in the beginning, it can I agree it can be difficult to pick the right tool. Uh, so in the beginning, if you just want to have a really basic shell script and maybe a few like really basic Kubernetes YAML files, that's perfectly fine. Um, and then uh, you know, first thing is. Uh, uh, this, this automation means that you can set up new environments really easy, really quickly. So I think that's, uh, that's great. And the second thing is that over time, you're going to realize what kind of tools you need. And that goes into a slightly different question. You know, when folks ask me, Hey, should I use Helm or Customize or YTT or JSON or Q or this other tool? Um, I, well, um, I, I think it's, um, uh, Matt Stratton had a really good quote about this uh, when people ask him, hey, should I use Puppet or Chef? And his answer was, yes, <laughs> pick one. It doesn't matter, but pick one. So here is the same idea. You know, it's like, well, get started with shell scripts and simple Kubernetes YAML. And then at some point, you're going to have kind of a pain points. Um, and that's going to guide you to the right tool. I know many people who still deploy their Kubernetes manifest with shell scripts and doing like search and replace with uh, uh, Unix tools like sed and envsubst. And if it works for them, I'm like, fine, that's great. You know, like I, sometimes I, I've seen folks who had like uh, maybe 20 lines of shell script and they replace that with 50 lines of Helm charts. And I'm like, okay, it's great. You've wrote a Helm chart and Helm is an amazing tool that has lots of uses, but it, is that really progress? You know, <laughs> uh, you, you had this really simple 20 lines shell script and you made it like now this huge pile of templatized YAML. So maybe for your use case, that was not the best idea. Um, so again, you know, like, uh, instead of thinking about, oh, what's the best tool? The question is, what's the problem that I have today? What's the thing I'm trying to solve? And then I can think about what's the, what's the best tool for that. Yeah, no, that makes more sense. It's like you learn a few set of steps, then next automate. Like it also just not forget the notice. It, as a developer, as you rightly said, like we wouldn't remember a lot of things. Probably we would have yep. bookmarked those uh, blog posts, or even if we have bookmarked, there is a very good chance that we haven't organized those bookmarks. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, yeah, automating is a really good approach over there. Right. So, 
Yeah. Coming to uh, the thing like, let's say a person is now uh, looking forward to getting started with Docker or Kubernetes, right? So, what would you suggest them? How should they go forward? So, w when folks ask me, uh, how do I get started? I think um, I kind of send back the question in how do you learn like what's the best way for you to learn and um okay maybe this is obvious for for many folks but for me honestly it wasn't it took me a really long time to realize well we all learn differently some folks like to read books some folks like blog posts some folks like video courses, like you know, like on platforms like uh, Udemy, Coursera, or whatever. Some folks prefer live training. Uh, some folks like um, live coding, live demos, um, which is not exactly live training because you know you're you're not like paying someone to teach you the thing, but you're going to their live stream and and you can interact with them. So, uh, so it's kind of in between. Some folks learn best from conference and meetup talks uh, because it's a uh, it's a kind of dedicated uh, time and 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 space, um, and you you have access to the speaker after. Uh, and some folks learn best by building things. They're like okay, you can read all the tutorials and watch all the videos you want, but some folks are going to really understand only when they stop using thing you're writing their docker files and etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think the first step is to realize what works best for me uh, and once you know that uh, then you can pick the right resource uh, you know so in in terms of books for instance um, you can look for the Kubernetes books written uh, by Kelsey Hightower. I think Joe Beda has one as well. Uh, the, these are like, Joe Beda was one of the uh, original authors of Kubernetes. Uh, so obviously he has lots of great resources on the matter. Uh, and Kelsey Hightower is also extremely famous in the um, Kubernetes ecosystem. He has like tons and tons of amazing resources as well. If you prefer blog posts, it's a little bit more difficult because there are so many out there. Um, video courses, um, there are lots of great resources. Like for instance, uh, Brett Fisher has courses on, I think he has one of the best Docker courses on, uh, on Udemy. Um, he has a Kubernetes course as well. There are also lots of really high quality uh, videos uh, from Anais Ehrlich um, and uh, there is, um, uh, what's her name, Tech World with Nana, I think. Uh, they both have lots of uh, uh, really, really great free content. Um, some folks will prefer live training and there are also many opportunities for that. Like, well, I, I do live training myself, so of course I I do that, but I'm not I'm obviously not the only one. Like there are literally tens, if not hundreds, of companies and people doing that. Um, conference and meetups. I always encourage folks to check out their local uh, Docker and Kubernetes and cloud native meetups. Um, they are uh, super active. Um, so a few weeks ago, I was uh, presenting a doing the, an introduction on, on the keynotes on the Kubernetes Community Days in, in Paris, France. Um, and I was uh, kind of reminding people that the French community was super active and I was showing them the numbers of participants in the Docker meetups in different places. And so I don't remember the exact numbers, but let's say Paris 5,000 and San Francisco 4,000, like New York 4,000. So you're like, oh, so Paris is really active on, on the container space. But then you have, I think it was maybe Bangalore 15,000. <laughs> so it's a, a good way to um, to put things in perspective. Um, and so, yeah, I think meetups are a really good way to, I mean, of course, to learn, but also to interact uh, with the speakers. Um, you know, from from my personal experience, if you if there is a topic that's interesting to you uh, and there is a, a talk about it, if it's at a conference, I mean, uh, if if you can talk five or ten minutes with the speaker, you're going to be pretty lucky. Well, if it's a local meetup, you have a higher chance of being able to 
and engage with them, have a longer conversation. And, and if it's a meetup, you know, you probably live in the same area, so you can uh, follow up and etc. So that's also a really great way. And of course, learning by doing. Um, so if you're learning Docker, a really good thing to do is, well, Dockerize stuff. You know, <laughs> if you're a developer, you, you have applications. So of course you can try to containerize them and try to make it easy for others to run them. Uh, like we were seeing in the beginning, like a Git clone Docker compose up. Um, and you learn a lot, uh, by, by doing that, like it's, uh, um, for sure. So that, that would be my, my different options. Okay. And that actually a very useful list of information. It's like, for example, tech world planners, something that even I used to, uh, fund of when I was starting out with Docker and Kubernetes. Okay. So, yeah. On that. So coming to the end of right, like do you have any advice for the current set of audience over here? Sure. So on on the Docker side, uh I think I'm I'm going to, you know, repeat one more time a thing that's really important to me. Um containers and Docker are here to help us. So it's just a tool to achieve something. Uh, you know, like uh Nobody is going to say, oh, I'm really proud of my hammer or my electric drill. I'm so glad I, I, I have it. No, it's like, well, thanks to my hammer or my electric drill, I'm able to build this great furniture. And uh, that, that's the goal. You know, and I'm not buying tools just so that I can put that in, in my workshop. Uh, I'm buying tools because I'm building stuff. So that's first thing to keep in mind. I always try like, okay, how... How can Docker help me and not the other way around, basically? And for Kubernetes, um, you know, Kubernetes has the reputation of being complex. And I would say I partially agree. I would say, yes, it's complicated if you want to know everything about Kubernetes. Uh, yeah, then there is a lot to learn. But if you just need to know enough to deploy your applications um, in a you know small, dev environment, you can start there and you can then build on top of that. For instance, uh, a really good way, in my opinion, to learn Kubernetes is to, yeah, okay, start with uh, deploying my app on Kubernetes. And now, okay, the thing you were describing earlier, for instance, I want to have um, each uh, pull request or each branch, uh, I want that to be deployed in a different namespace or something like that then how can I automate that? Uh, maybe I can plug that in my GitLab or GitHub Actions or Bitbucket or whatever uh, Git system I'm using. Uh, and um, at some point, you know, like th this is dev and staging. So there is no, there is no risk for production. If I, if I majorly screw up with this, I'm not going to have downtime, downtime or outages. But doing that, we actually learn a lot. Uh, and at some point, eventually we reached a point where we're like, well, um, after all these weeks or months, now I have this fully automated system that, you know, like, uh, deploys each branch or each pull request to a different namespace in my Kubernetes cluster. And I automatically like restore the test data set and this and blah, blah, blah. Well, maybe. Uh, we maybe now I feel confident enough to run that for production, um, and that's that's a path that I see uh, happening quite a bit uh, because staging is a really great way to learn about the system, uh, you know, low risk um, and but fast moving as well. Um, and at some point, yeah, folks are like, well. <laughs> Um, a couple of people have told me or at some point, like, well, uh, we decided to move, um, the production to Kubernetes before the, the planned date, because we realized that we liked the staging environment more, uh, you know, to, to keep the story short, but basically they, they were at the point where they had spent, 
so much time, like really making the, the CD pipeline like so nice. Okay, we commit, we push, and then we try to make that like as fast as possible. And so five minutes later, uh, the staging environment is ready. So that's great. And, and on the other side, they had the old um, system. I don't remember what they were using exactly, but for production, that would take, I don't know, half an hour or an hour. And so at some point they were like, why are we uh, using this old deployment system for production? Uh, we have a, a really nice and fast and robust system for staging. So let's use it as well for production. I mean, it had been the plan, but it had been the plan after a few more maybe months of testing. And at some point I decided, no, okay, it's stable enough uh, and it's, it's going to save us so much time and so much money and blah, blah, blah. So uh, we're going to take a shortcut and use the new fancy system for production. So for me, that's a really great example. Yeah. And now you said like that uh, the GitOps things have come a very long way. Exactly. So, yeah. Very long way. Like currently, even I see that uh, with our uh, enterprise systems or the like where people are now very keen on implementing those things to production as well. Like, they're like, okay, it works on staging. A lot of times I've even seen people where uh, they're not even, uh, it's not even a point where things are like entirely stable in staging. It, but they saw that it is saving a lot of time, it is saving a lot of effort. It's like, look, let's just use it in production. What happens happens. We'll we'll figure that out. Like yeah, we've seen people doing that right now. Like the trust that has built up on systems is extremely high that they're ready to take the risk. Like they know for a fact that even at the most riskiest point, their loss is not that that high. Right? They still have a backup plan. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So. Yeah, that that's probably that's it for today. Like, man, it was amazing talking to you. I'm mean, learning a lot of things from your experience, your point of view on the Docker and Kubernetes world. Likewise, yeah. Thanks for having me. It was a really great conversation.